Every time Juliana Velasquez enters the Bellator cage, she's motivated by the memory of her brother, Rafael. In her last fight, Velasquez became Bellator's flyweight world champion by eliminating previously unbeaten Alima Lay McFarlane in a unanimous decision victory. And now the new Bellator flyweight world champion, Juliana Velasquez. And as she's done so many times before, she dedicated the win to Rafael. Who's always on her mind and remains close to her heart. A toda minha equipe, meus professores, a minha família, ao meu irmão, que eu sei que ele tá aqui comigo. Tonight, Velasquez makes her first title defense, but standing in the way is Miss Dynamite. How good was that? Denise Kielholz, the reigning Bellator kickboxing flyweight world champion who's riding a four-fight MMA win streak and looks to add another belt to her collection and become Bellator's first multi-sport champion. The title is on the line as the undefeated champ, Juliana Velasquez, looks to honor her late brother once again, while number three ranked Denise Kielholz aims to make combat sports history. defense of that world title comes against another champion from another discipline. Denise Kielholz, a world champion in Muay Thai, a world champion in kickboxing, realized dipping a toe into MMA wouldn't be enough. Four wins later, she's on the verge of a world title triple crown. It is great to see you. I'm Sean Grandy. Always fascinating, the first world title defense to see the longtime hunter finally become the hunted. But especially fascinating for Juliana Velasquez tonight because when this evening is over, we're likely going to be asking the question, how did she fight as opposed to how well? Why? To unlock that mystery and so many more, we bring in Big John McCarthy. Great fighters, champions, great athletes are stubborn. They do what they want to do. Is Juliana Velasquez being too stubborn in her insistence that she's going to keep this fight? On the feet. She's not being too stubborn because she's been so dominant in doing so in the past. You got to believe in her. She believes in herself, and that is what is key here. She's a great judo player. She was on the national team in Brazil, but her stand up has been deadly here in the Bellator cage. She has taken care of everybody who has stepped in front of her, and she believes she can do the same thing with Denise Keelholz. There are so many impressive things about Denise Keelholz, but maybe at the top of the list is this. She realized to go from one top of the mountain to the other, she couldn't just make the jump. She had to go all the way down and climb all the way back up. Yeah, people think that, oh, it's the same sport. It's not. They're completely different. The way that you go about your footwork, the defense, everything is different, and she realized that. She realized, I cannot be the world champion in kickboxing and an MMA champion at the same time. I need to decide which one. She decided, I'm giving up the kickboxing, I'm going to MMA, and she has made that transition. Her power now is different. The way that she brings herself inside is different, and she has been dynamite. That's the main event. We can't wait. Now, three weeks ago, Liz Carmouche put her name on the list as the number one contender with an opening minute knockout to face the winner of the main event tonight. But that leaves us. There's one other name I think we're forgetting. And as we go to Jen Brown and Josh Thompson, can you guys help us shed some light on who that might be? I feel like we can help you out, Sean. Can't we? Of course, it's a Lima Lay McFarland. Hey, look, if we were going to talk about the flyweight world title, why not bring in our former five-time world champ at the flyweight division, Alima Champ? Thanks for joining us tonight. We're excited to have you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. We're excited for you too, Josh. I don't want you to feel left out. Yeah, I mean, someone <laughs> thought it was a bright idea to put the rose between the two thorns, so I thought this was a great idea. Uh, Lovely. He's been working I'll on be that line on. all I'll be getting night. picked on all night. All night. 
I see what's going on here. Well, well before we get into the fight, Salim let's talk about it. Last time we saw you, you were in the cage with Juliana Velasquez. You relinquished your title. I know you've uh, got injured. You've had some surgery. Just catch us up real quick on how you're doing, how you're healing. Well, my nose is okay. As you can see, you'll see a uh, plenty highlight reel uh, with that knee that uh, broke my nose. But it wasn't my nose I had to get surgery on. It was actually my knee. I did suffer uh, an injury in the fight. But I'm one week post-op. I feel great. And, uh, you know, Sean is right. I'm still up there. The Pineapple Princess 2.0 is coming back. We look forward to seeing you back in the cage soon. So let's talk about our main event tonight. Juliana Velasquez, she is defending her belt for the first time. I want to go back to weigh-ins yesterday. I was standing next to you, Ali Malay, when we watched them. There was a couple of takeaways for me, obviously, the size difference. That's something we're going to talk about later. But what we saw was something uncharacteristic, I think, because you were surprised, right? When these two faced off against each other, they had to be separated. So what did you take away from that, Ali Malay? What was your thoughts when you saw that happen? But I pretty much had my popcorn out for that stare-off. I mean, like you said, they physically had to be separated. They would not turn to the front, which is out of character for both of them. I mean, I stood across Juliana Velasquez, and we shook hands, we bowed to each other, and we faced forward. So hopefully that intensity that we saw on the weigh-ins can translate to the cage. Well, Joshua, both women, they have that Sambo background, right? We've got Denise Kielholtz, as Sean and uh, Big John talked about, five-time world champion kickboxer, stylistically break this one down for yeah, us. Yeah, both of them have a judo background. Both of them are black belts in judo. Both of them are great on the feet as well. Um, Juliana Vaz is longer. She likes to use that jab a lot to parry down there and throw the straight left down the pipe. She's good at getting in the distance, but I don't know if she wants to be inside against Denise Kilholz. Denise Kilholz is a dog in the mix. She gets inside there, and I'm telling you right now, she lets the hands fly, and they're tight, crisp combinations, and we've seen from our last couple of fights, if she touches you on the chin, it will be lights out. The other thing as well, in terms of the, of the face-off, Denise Kilholz is that, that fighter, though. She has that switch, and I've seen it several times when I've called some of her fights over in the UK. She is someone that, like, when you get her, when you hit her, she wants to hit you back. A lot of fighters are that way, but she's nasty when it comes to that. She wants to make sure that she's imposing her will, and I think that she's going to try to do that. The stare down was just the beginning portion of this. Well, that's a great indicator of what we are going to have. We are going to have tonight. I'm getting excited right now talking about it. Well, both women told us this week they are going to be looking for a finish tonight. Uh, of course, it has all the makings for an exciting fight. Now, in our co-main event, though, tonight we've got a clash of the heavyweights. Tyrell Fortune, a wrestler with great stand-up. Now he's got six KOs on his record. He's Looking to make it number seven, but veteran Matt Mitrione, well, he has other plans for his former wrestling coach, telling us this week, I have no problem punching my friend in the face. Well, in our Bantamweight feature bout, CJ Hamilton will take on Mateus Matos. Now, Matos comes in winning eight of his last ten. He's looking to make a statement. Now, Hamilton, though, he told us this week that it is his speed and his footwork. He thinks those are going to be the difference in this matchup. Then in our second fight of the night, Diana Silva, she's putting the 145ers, excuse me, on notice, which she takes on Arlene Blenko. Now, Blenko holds the Bellator record for the fastest knockout and finish in women's history. She says we're going to see the best version of her in the cage tonight. And of course, we got to kick off the night with our main card. It is a middleweight showdown. And so let's head down to Sean Grandy for more on that. All right, Jen, take care of Josh because he seems a little delusional here at the start. All right, four weeks from tonight, Gegard Mousasi will defend the middleweight world title against the number one contender of the veteran John Salter. But behind them at 185, the line of undefeated young prospects turning into contenders before our eyes. And now one of them, Johnny Eblen, gets perhaps his toughest test. Tonight's first fighter, Travis Bambay. Roller coaster capital of the U.S. Go ahead. I'll wait. Travis Davis doesn't have to. He's lived it. Four years in the Marines, a military policeman in Okinawa. Stops and starts in his MMA career. A 5-0 record in boxing. Just waiting for this to finally get a shot on the big stage after riding the roller coaster for 10 years. And oh yeah, the roller coaster capital of the U.S. at the Sandusky, Ohio. Travis Davis's hometown. John, this is a high-risk, high-reward fun fighter. This is a fighter that he's got great hands. He's got great submissions. He takes big chances. That's where sometimes he's gotten himself in trouble. We'll see if those big risks pay off tonight. And now, his opponent, Johnny Diamond Hands Evelyn. You may or may not be a part of the cryptocurrency movement, but Johnny Eblen is, and his latest nickname, Diamond Hands, is what they call those who aren't moved by swings in the market. 
But John, that name works for Johnny Eblen on a variety of levels when you watch him fight. Boy, it does. Johnny Eblen has got it all. He's smart, he's technical, he's a little bit nasty. Look at that left hand right there. Goes after him quick with the ground and pound and puts him out. Johnny Eblen is just getting better and better and believing in himself. That makes him dangerous. The tail of the tape at 185. Very simple here, tail of the tape. You got a guy in Johnny Eblen, eight and no, he believes in himself. Travis Davis, he's the more experienced veteran. We'll see what he can do to bring that record with a one. A night that ends with a flyweight world title on the line begins as always with Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to Bellator MMA from Mohegan Sun Arena, live on Showtime. We kick it off here at Bellator 262 with three five-minute rounds in the middleweight division. Introducing the blue corner at six foot, weighing in 186 pounds, making his Bellator debut. He brings 10 professional victories, four losses by way of upper Sandusky. He fights out of Columbus, Ohio, Travis Bam Bam Davis. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at six foot one, weighing in 186 pounds. As a professional, he's undefeated. Eight wins, no defeats. By way of Kansas City, Missouri, he fights out of Coconut In charge, Kevin McDonald. Something to ponder. All of these young, huge prospect, undefeated fighters that finally stumbled. Always seem to do it, John, against a veteran who you weren't expecting. Ready to fight? With great jujitsu. Ready to fight? Let's go. We're going to see right now, Johnny Emlin is coming out. He feels confident in this fight. But Travis has got very good stand-up, and he's got a good ground game. You heard Coconut Creek, which means American Top Team and the run they are on in Bellator is absurd and continued in the premiums tonight. Syed Soma and Cody Law. Travis Davis says Johnny Eblen is a front runner, quick starter. He said he goes berserker when he gets you on the ground, which is not a bad description for what Johnny Eblen does. Oh, that's a pretty accurate description. The one thing that Johnny's got in his back pocket, he is a good wrestler. He's can always go to that wrestling technique when he wants. University of Missouri's put some pretty good ones in the MMA. You talked about Travis Davis, the fights that he's lost, even the fights he's won. He is a risk taker. So he's, again, high risk, high reward. He is a risk taker. When we talk about risk, he will go after a submission when he doesn't have that exact position that we would want you to be in to go for that you know, type of submission, but he'll go for it. That's one of the things I really enjoy watching with him. He tries to finish fights, be it in a stand-up or on the ground. Oh, he just took a big shot. He did. You can see it hurt him. You see that little stump over his foot? He got buzzed by it. Eyes are wide open now. You see him trying to parry that left hand of Johnny. Parry it down so he can bring the right hand over the top. This American Top Team thing, it's, it's all, it's building on each other. The success is building. And the guys that you are training with and the coaches and confidence just grows. Each guy helps the other guy. It, well, success is contagious when you're around guys. You know, look at the guys that Johnny Inland is training with. Every one of them undefeated right now in their career. You know, he is every day going in the gym and getting better and better. So one thing that I love, what I see out of him, is he wants to learn new things all the time. That's what makes him a very dangerous fighter. First attempt at a level change. No one that wrestles with Steve Mako ever comes out of it without lacking confidence in their wrestling against anybody else. And this is what we're talking about. And again, just before that takedown, Johnny landed a very solid left-right combination.
King Mo, a very familiar face, mask or not, to Bellator fans. Mike Brown, one of the best that's ever done it, both inside the cage and then as a coach, unbelievable. Take down into the ride, we'll land a couple of shots. So this is where Johnny, he stays patient. And one of the things that Johnny doesn't worry about is he's, he, he'll tell you, I like when guys try to stand up. In fact, I let them stand up so they feel like they're getting somewhere, and then I just take them back down again just to take all that will away from them. We had a really interesting conversation with Johnny Eppel the other day, and his, to call him a student of the game is an understatement. But he has literally chosen the top people in every part. And he's, he's mentioned names to us, like Canelo, like Raymond Daniels, like in every possible field there is. Like he wants to be as good as Raymond Daniels as this. There's, there's got to be a danger in spreading yourself a little too thin. Ambition's good. Oh, ambition is great. And you look and you say, you know, I want to have the spinning techniques of Raymond Daniels. Well, that's a good person to say, I want to emulate what they do. Oh, that's a big shot. Don't work on being the same because there's too many elements to the game. Followed by the takedown. This right, just look at the tenacious pace that Johnny is bringing right now. This is hard to deal with if you're Travis Davis. It has only been finished once in 14 professional fights. You can see why, because he's taking some big shots here. Johnny Eblen getting him going in, coming out. A lot of good work by both fighters, but Johnny's been controlling exactly where this fight's going to be fought. Thomas Davis has done some boxing. Undefeated, in fact. He's confident everywhere. He's in there with a different level of animal right now. Very impressive first round for the undefeated Johnny Evans. Breathe, breathe. How you feel? How you feel? Okay, the thing stop. Bring the drum section. Pop on the jab. Take your stance. Look at some of the replays right here. Evan coming. Nice left hook right over the top of the guard. So Travis going back and then comes again with a straight right hand. That straight right hand has landed several times in this fight. There goes that left hand over the top. Johnny's been able to keep his head off of the center line when he's thrown, which has made it hard for Travis to counter. Beautiful right hand there landing clean. Left hand right to the wrestling. That transition into the wrestling makes it difficult for Travis to stop everything. That's what you call being a smart fighter. We talked about Mike Brown and Steve Mako, and they are elite of the elite. I am not in any way surprised that King Mo has transitioned into this because he was always such a cerebral fighter and student of the fight game. King Mo is a, he's a unique individual. First off, he was a great athlete, unbelievable wrestler. But as you said, incredibly intelligent Gentlemen, and an incredible fight IQ. That was a nice low kick by Travis Davis. That, that left a, a little memory thought into the head of Johnny Evans for the first time. This really has all the makings. Josh said during the prelims, he was exactly right. We were all on the same page. If any fight here is going to steal the show, this was going to be it. Well, that's because we've all watched Travis fight, and we know how tough he is, and we know that he does not give in ever. And he creates situations that create a fun fight, something where action takes place. I think he said that. I don't usually listen to Josh to talk about it. He said that, right? Somebody told like that. He's not going to survive with Jenna Lee. Eyes drop down. Great change of levels by Johnny. He's got, it, he's got his hands hooked on those legs. He should be able to get him up. So Travis trying to dig that underhook. That's impossible to defend at this level. Travis Davis, 34 years old, a late start because of his military service. There you go, there you go. Yeah. And 
that's Johnny getting his head high right now. You get your head high on that position. Now you can drive him down towards the canvas. Travis trying to use that fence as a, as a balance point. Keeping that arm posted up. Look at where his right arm's at. That's what's going to give Johnny problems. He needs to take that away. Not even, not even a thought of surrendering the position. When the guy gets up. He's, you're exactly right. It's what, what he talked about with us. Let him up. Take him back down. And what you're seeing, you're, there you go. you're seeing Travis trying to fight the hands, which is a, the right thing to do. You can't break the grip of Johnny, and if you can't break that grip, you're just going to go on for a ride right back down to the campus. Johnny Evelyn, like most great fighting careers, started as a younger brother with older brothers who beat the heck out of him. <laughs> Why is it that story is always the same? <laughs> it is, isn't it? It's right up there with, I had the best camp of my life, and my weight's on point, and I've never been hurt. And this is what Johnny was talking about, just taking it, basically breaking someone's mentality in the fight. Letting him get up and then taking him right back down. Proving to him, you cannot stop what I do. McDonald reminding him a lot of guys who can reach him for the fence. <laughs> There's some heavy shots Travis has taken there. He's got to be wary of. He keeps on looking to grab over the fence, too. Future at 185 in Bellator is looking better and better every day. There are some blue chippers on that list. You saw right there, Johnny trying to pull him out through the cage, and it was actually the grab of the cage that kept Travis from going. Overhand right, left got in. These are big shots. That was set up by a big right elbow. This is what we're talking. You saw how Travis went for that gear. He did. It wasn't in the position you want to go to give up that position, putting your back onto the canvas. That was a Hail Mary. Yeah. This has been a game performance by Travis Davis. But he has been mauled here through two rounds. We always talk about the good news is you're on the big show, under the bright lights, on the main card. The bad news is that usually means you're facing somebody elite on the other side. And you can see right yeah, now, numbers. Davis has landed 13 of 34 compared to 61 of 92 for Johnny. Looks like Travis Davis got a cut on his forehead. That is not Johnny's, Johnny's own that he's wearing. Lock him. Get him locked him, Travis. Attack his face. You can see Travis Davis is in shape because he has put out a lot of energy here. He just can't stop what Johnny Evelyn is doing. Travis Davis was thrilled to be here at Mohegan Sun this week in Bellator because he had to do that PFL bubble. <laughs> Trapped in that thing for weeks and weeks. Well, that's a couple week bubble. That's not fun. Neither is this for 10 minutes. <laughs> Clean break, guys. Watch how effective Johnny picks him up, drops him down. Travis really had a problem breaking the grip of Johnny Evelyn, which sometimes is not an easy thing to keep when you're wearing gloves. It's not the same as just having your hands. Johnny's got that beautiful gable grip. He just kept picking him up, bringing him down. That elbow set up a beautiful left hand right here that lands clean. And then a right hand just swings and misses, but the left hand comes back and touches him again. Then right back to the wrestling. When he pulls away, that's your chance. That's like a nightmare. Got it. Two strong, solid 10 nines here. As dominant as it been, there's not, these aren't fight ending moments. This is just a the one guy being better than the other. That's right exactly now. what you have. It's you know they're dominant 10 9 rounds, but not enough to go into a 10 8. I learned from the best. <laughs> That, that, the, the 10 8 became a new toy. We talk about fighters with new toys. The 10 8 became a new toy, it did. right? For judges. Yeah. We got a little bit too far. Yeah, exactly. Travis Davis is talking. He's trying to land that counter. 
Last one again. <laughs> He's talking the whole time. But instead of talking, he needs to start throwing those hands just a little bit more. Difference, obviously, in heavyweight and middleweight, but the strong wrestling followed with the MMA, the MMA version of wrestling in the ground and pound. Well, right now, you know, I'm sure that Travis's corner told him that we need to finish. So he's looking to land that big shot, but he should be looking just to land clean shots. Just don't worry about throwing big, heavy shots. Land clean shots that lead you to that big shot. Getting a lot of ones for each fighter. And we've seen dominating the fight can sap your own energy. Yeah, but you can, right now, as you're watching the fight, look at the diaphragm of Johnny Evelyn. He is absolutely under control, no heavy breathing. He's in shape. He's feeling very good right now. And that is his, there is a coldness that comes in his personality. Efficiency. Just right there with that takedown. And watch the way that he just pulls the ankle out. Little effort, doesn't burn a lot of energy in getting the takedown. Travis looking for the Kimura grip. Told us he's trying to become more mechanistic in his lifestyle, more scientific. And again, Johnny going back to that gable grip that Travis has had so much trouble trying to break. Set up for another one. Again, remember Travis Davis held on to the cage in the first round of this one. Missouri Tigers are proud of that moment right there. Again, you saw Johnny setting up his hips coming in. Whenever you're going to see that suplex, watch for the fighter's hips to come hip to hip against his opponent. Same thing. Dragging the ankle out, beautiful transition by Johnny. Why burn all that energy trying to pick him up? This just shows where Johnny is now becoming a smart fighter, which is only going to make him more dangerous in the cage. Full marks here for Travis Davis. This has been a pretty good battery for 13 minutes. Oh, yeah. He's still hunting for it. He's still going. That's what I love about him as a fighter. I mean, he's got no give. He never settles. He's always looking to finish the fight. Just right now, he's in against a guy technically that can just control the position, land big shots, and make him work at a pace that's hard for him to sustain. So he's very verbal during the fight. He had a fight in his younger days where he was basically talking to the other coaches. Minute three, Johnny. Minute three, Trav. You're doing good. Johnny Upland's talking has been a little different here for 14 minutes. Johnny's, other, Johnny's been talking with the team. Yeah. This just, you know, the, right, this ride that you're seeing, Johnny, all this pressure. This is exhausting to have someone on you with their weight like that is. Now he, doesn't have, he doesn't have a good position for that choke to work. It's on the chin, but it can be a crank, and it can definitely dislocate your jaw if he gets enough pressure on it. I don't believe he has his other hand fixed in a position where he can create that type of pressure. But don't think that because that's not under the chin that it cannot cause Travis Davis a problem. Okay. He's flattened out for a second. Johnny getting a little high. Right away gets his hip, hip back. You see how he gets hips to hip? Just shows his wrestling prowess. This was a relentless performance by Johnny Evans. You know he wants one more. Oh, he wanted one more. He just giving it everything he had. You can see his brain moving towards it. And he didn't need it. This was dominant Stop. by Johnny Edwin. Fifth rank middleweight already in Bellator. And number five with a bullet. Here's the suplex. 
talk suplex. I don't know if they're going to show the whole body here, but you'll see when he gets his hips right up next to his opponent's hips, that's when you see him start to go for a ride. See how his hips are underneath him now? Now he brings him back over the top. Beautiful job. Notice his head doesn't hit. Only Travis Davis. Travis did a good job of going with it, which helped him not get hurt by that suplex, but that was a beautiful toss. The new mayor of Suplex City with some dominant numbers in this dominant performance. What made it so impressive is that Travis Davis is a dangerous guy, but he could never get himself in position. You saw impressive just to be there. After 15 minutes of that mauling by Johnny Evelyn, who did his job and then some in the opener tonight, making King Mo very proud. There are so many traps for undefeated young fighters. This certainly was one. It looked like on paper for Johnny Evelyn, but. No problem, start to finish. Michael C. Williams will make it official. Ladies and gentlemen, for the decision, we'll go to your three judges at cage side. Your first, Brian Minor, scores the fight 30 to 27, while judges Doug Crosby and Chris Lee both see it in the same 30 to 26. I'll have it for the winner by unanimous decision, Johnny Diamond Hayes Evelyn. Nine and zero and getting better. It seems every time out, Johnny Evelyn keeps the role going in Bellator for American Top Team, and he's with Big John McCarthy. Johnny Eblen, that was a fantastic, dominant performance. You came out here looking to strike in the beginning, and then you went to your wrestling. Talk to me about what went through your mind as far as, uh, I'm going to bring this to the ground. Now, my coaches, when I came back to the corner, told me not to brawl. So I took their advice, and I, wrestled, or I fought and wrestled smart. Well, let's talk about your coaches there, because ATT has had a very good night tonight. You got guys like Mo Law and Mike Brown in your corner. What kind of confidence does that give you as a fighter? Great confidence. They give me great advice, and I just listen to them. That's my job as a fighter, listen to my coaches. There's multiple times in this fight you landed beautiful left hands. You hurt him a couple of times. You went to the suplex. You got a beautiful suplex. You tried to go back to it right at the yeah. end to get it. Wasn't there. What was your feeling during this fight? Because he was talking to you the whole time. Yeah, he was talking shit, saying, hey, like, let's brawl in the corner. I'm like, bro, that's stupid. That's why you're not where I'm at. You don't fight smart. You're trying to come out here and brawl. You can do that all you want, but you're not going to be a world champion like me. Well, that sounds right as far as what I was looking at. You were fighting smart, technical. Who now? You are 9-0 and in this cage. You don't have to worry about going back to ATT because all those guys that you train with that are undefeated, you still can train with them because yeah. you're still undefeated. <laughs> but... Who do you want to fight next? Um, honestly, I wouldn't mind going to someone else's territory and taking on them. Uh, I heard that we might be going overseas, so a hey, uh, top 10 guy, Charlie Ward. Uh, I'd love to share the, uh, not the octagon, the, the Bellator cage with you. The, Char Charlie, the Bellator cage Charlie Ward from SBG sounds like a good fight to me. That was a beautiful performance. Congratulations hey, on a big win. Send that contract, it's signed on my end already. Sounds good to me. Ladies and gentlemen, your winner, Johnny Iblin. Doesn't lack for confidence, and why should he? He is 9-0. Josh, you thought this had a chance to be fight of the night and steal the show. Instead, Johnny Iblin stole that entire show. How impressive was that? That was very, it was a very dominant performance. He did everything he was supposed to do. What I liked was he brought his wrestling back into it. You'll find that sometimes wrestlers fall in love with their power like Tyrell Fortune has, and all they want to do then after that is stand after a great performance in his last fight with the knockout that he had. So Alima Light, you love to be on the ground. But what do you think of his performance and the control that he had on the ground tonight? I thought it was textbook. I mean, he started the fight opening with those leg kicks, getting 
Davis thinking about those leg kicks and then switching up to his wrestling. And the crazy thing too is that his opponents know what he's going to do and they still can't stop him. He's an amazing rider. He just stays heavy on them like a damp blanket. And he just rides you like a backpack. So like an impressive performance, dominant. He is definitely ready for a top 10 opponent. Well, let's talk about top 10. And let's look at, look at our rankings real quick because he sits in the number five spot. We just heard him call out Charlie Ward. Josh, is there anybody else uh, on this list that you think would be a good matchup for him next? Yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to see him go backwards. Not with the dominant performance that he just had. Look, John Salter's next in line to fight Gegard Mousasi for the title, okay? Then you've got Austin Vanderford, who is his teammate, who is also undefeated and has some great performance as well. So he's probably going to be next in line after John Salter. So why not let's have Johnny Evelyn fight either Fabian Edwards or Costello Van Stinas. The reason why I say Costello Van Stinas is for one reason. Costello Van Stinas is teammates with Gegard Mousasi, so he's not in a big hurry to get to the title shot because he doesn't want to fight his teammate. And Gegard's been there for so long, you know? So you got he wants to leave that alone. So why not have Costello knock off all the number one contenders? All right. And you know, he said he wanted to fight overseas. Costello is overseas. There you go. Good insight there. All Thank right. you. Thank you very much. I like it. Well, <laughs> still to come, our main event of the evening, uh, the champ, Juliana Velasquez. She is 11-0. She has never tasted defeat. And she says that it is her size and her reach that will give her the advantage tonight. And she told us this week that she is confident in her striking and her grappling. And she is calling for a finish tonight. Well, her opponent, though, Denise Kielhoch, she started competing in judo as a teenager and then went on to become a five-time world champion kickboxer. Now, tonight, she has the opportunity to make another dream come true, becoming Bellator's flyweight world champ. She said this isn't just for the title. It's about all those years that she spent training, and tonight, it is about her legacy. Well, I cannot wait for our main event. That's the flyweights. But coming up next, we've got two women, featherweights, who both love to stand and trade. They're looking to throw down tonight. We've got Arlene Blenko. She's a former title challenger. Now, she is coming in off a of full training camp, Alima Malay at Jackson Winks. She didn't have that in her last fight. She says that it's uh, going to be the difference maker tonight. She says we are going to see Arlene Blenko 2.0. So what does that look like? I mean, I've been following her camp the entire time, and she looks so prepared, doing hill sprints on the famous, you know, Jackson Winkler uh, MMA spot. You know, has high-level training partners in Holly Holmes, Clarissa Shields, and which inadvertently actually made her focus on her wrestling because she said, Look, I didn't want to stand in front of somebody like Clarissa Shields and take her punches, so she started focusing on her wrestling, so I'm really excited to see her put all of that together and be the well-rounded MMA fighter that she is. Well, Josh, this is Silva's only second fight in Bellator. Uh, she says, you know, she really wants to establish herself in the division. She's got a great opportunity to do that tonight. What do you want to see from her? I thought she, I think she's already established herself in the division. She had a great fight against Julia Budd. A lot of people thought she won. At least it was close enough to get, to make people believe that she was in that fight in, in to win it. So I look at all she's got to do is to keep her back off the fence. Don't let Arlene press her to the fence and control that distance. Her what she brings to the table is the speed, the reach, the range, the agility to move left and right and stick and move. If she can do that, Arlene's gonna have a hard time getting her hands on her and touching her up with the with the boxing as well as getting into the clinch and the wrestling. So if she can do that, I think she'll have a successful night. I definitely see this being a barn burner. These two ladies want to strike. I love it. Well, Silva told us this week that she wants to keep this fight standing. She's calling for a knockout, but can she get it over a two-time boxing world champion in Blengo? Well, it's time to find out. John, back down to you. Yeah, that's the question. Josh and Lima were both talking about it. They want to see Johnny Eblen climb the ladder. Arlene Blenko is trying to do something harder, which is climb back up the ladder, because the last time we saw her inside the Bellator cage, Chris Cyborg was on the other side. Now her road to another meeting begins. Set now to make her way to the cage, Diana Silva. We often talk about championship fights, striking fighters to the deep water, which is probably the only thing about MMA that Diana Silva would have been comfortable with a year ago because she said she felt like a duck. Because ducks, he said, do everything. They fly, they walk, they swim, but they don't do anything well which is what she realized she needed to do to take the next step. Was able to quit her job and become a full-time MMA fighter. We saw it against Julia Budge. She was right there. And yeah, that's the difference when you see her against someone like Julia Budge. You're seeing someone who's all the way in. And that's what you have to be if you want to be a world champion. And now, Arlene.
self-absorbed Americans, we often think of Australians as doing everything backwards. It's hot in the winter, the current goes in the other direction, so maybe it's poetic that while so many fighters have turned their lives upside down when they become parents, Arlene Blenko went the other way. She was a mother of two when she started fighting, and you look at the start of her career, and look at the evolution of it. Now she's gotten better and better. She is the perfect example, John, of how it's not how you start, it is how you finish. And by the way, uh, she can start pretty quick now, too. Hey, she has gotten so good now with her wrestling comparatively, and a lot of that was, she said, I don't want to be punched by Clarissa Shields or Holly Holm. I've got to wrestle, learn how to wrestle. That's what I'm doing. A full camp at Jackson Wake for Arlene Blinko as we check out the tail of the tape. Our tail of the tape for this featherweight matchup, 64.5. There's a four-inch reach advantage to Diana Silva. We'll, we'll see. That's what Josh is talking about, staying on the outside and using that reach. Bellator MMA Live on Showtime now features three five-minute rounds in the featherweight division. Introducing the blue corner first. At five foot seven, weighing in 146 pounds. Her professional record nine and six from Napa, Iguaçu, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Presenting Diana Silva. And across the cage, her adversary fights out of the red corner. At five foot six, weighing in 146 pounds, the two time former world title challenger enters with 13 professional victories, eight losses from Penrith, Western Sydney, Australia. Introducing Arlene Engerfist Blanco. In charge of the action, referee Dan Mergliano. See that 13 and 8 record for Arlene Blanco? You say, well, that's not overly impressive. But remember, he, she had a late start in the sport. In her last seven years, she's 11 and 4, and the four losses two to Julia Budd, Chris Cyborg, and Marlos Cook. Yeah, you take a look at the quality of opponent is what you need to look at. Records sometimes are deceiving. I know a lot of people have got losing records. If you look at everyone that they fought, though, you go, all of them are killers. Major, major, major which was part of the, the center of the Matt Mitrione thing <laughs> this week when everybody was getting on him about losing some fights. And he said, um, you may want to look at my resume and see why I've been in there. Yeah, he's, he, sometimes, you know. He said it a little more forget. colorful late night showtime than that. the way but. he said it. Uh, sometimes you forget, man. It's, it's very difficult to get rid of a very good fighter. Sometimes it's difficult to win a fight against another really good fighter. <laughs> So one thing I love about Arlene Blanco, she normally, generally, usually doesn't throw looping shots. Most of her punches come straight down the pipe, which makes them fast and accurate. She taught, and it's, Jackson Wick is not new for her, but this was the first time she's had a full camp at this stage of her very good shot from Silva as she caught the foot, Blanco. But she talked about, here's an example of the difference. The first time she went, she was in awe of Holly Holm. Holly had just come off the knockout of Ronda Rousey. It was like, oh my God, that's Holly Holm. And now she's much more comfortable with her as a sparring partner. And who better to learn from? Well, you know, when you're when you're a fighter and you're, you're seeing these people and all of a sudden now you're working out with them, you're sparring with them. It's like, oh my God, I, I'm here with Holly Holm. She is great, but so you can be too. You just have to do those things that make you better and better. And that's what Arlene has done. And then after six weeks, eight weeks with Clarissa Shields and Holly Holm, suddenly you don't feel as uncomfortable when you walk in to Bellator cage. Well, one of the things you got to look at is you know, you're Arlene facing someone that's got speed like Diana, but the power that Clarissa, when you've been hit by someone like that, who is a two-time world, two-time Olympic gold medalist, three-time world champion, you guys are, well, at least I've been hit by the best, so it's not going to be any worse. You see those guys, all I think of is running his steps. I see. Mike Winkle, John, Greg Jackson, two of the very best there are. <laughs> Yep. It's another part of the evolution. Yes. Training within the teams. I mean, it's that's why the sport is. 
Silva, dangerous on the feet, but again, as you said, John, the difference is going to be the long looping shots versus you know, what Arlene Blanco straight ahead. You know, I think if you're looking, I think Dinah is a little bit faster with her hands, but hers are looping shots, so they're taking longer to get there, while Arlene's are more straight, which tends to get them there just a little bit faster. Dinah Silva has a Bellator connection, one of her coaches, longtime Bellator veteran, the former bantamweight world champion, Marcos Galvo. Remember, there was that three or four year run when he and Joe Warren and Eduardo Dantas just kept trading the Bantamweight world title back and forth. Dana Silva's done a really good job of utilizing a, a straight left jab and that low kick. She's been landing that calf kick repeatedly in this fight. She needs to keep sticking to it. I don't know what's more impressive if you think about it psychologically. Getting into the cage with Chris Seibel, and then going through all the work just for the chance to do it again. It's, you know, you have those moments, and a lot of people will tell you, you know, I almost froze in the moment because I was looking, going, oh my God, that's Chris Seibel. Yeah. You can't do that. She's just another fighter standing across from you, but now once you've been in that position like Arlene has, now you're just waiting for that chance to try to get back so you can prove what you can do. Arlene did it twice. True. Nice right hand of the body by Diana. See, just in the difference in approach in what I will boldly call unnecessary movement. And it's exactly, you know, it, you're looking at what Arlene's doing, very, very composed, but very relaxed. But not a lot of excessive movement, nothing exaggerated, while you're seeing a lot of exaggerated movement from Diana Solo. But she's comfortable in doing it. This is that's her style. Johnny Edlin, we talked about 10-9 rounds that are dominant. This is not an easy round to call. Well, they've both been effective at times, but you gotta go with who's landing the harder shots. Silva takes a chance and pays the price at the end of round one. Young lady, big breath for Arlene. Big one, go All right, big breath. Slow down your breathing. But big ones, big breathing. Well, that was an amazing round. You need to keep that up for me. Yeah, big breath. Big breath. That was an amazing round. You need to keep that up for me. Here, hold this water for me. Take it any time you want. So listen, you're doing beautiful. You're getting her timing, her rhythm, right? She's basically just pot shotting, running, pot shotting, running. Counter her counter. Okay, so lean back, boom, boom. She's gonna come back with a straight right or a left hook, and then just counter that immediately again. Yeah. Was it an amazing round for Bunko? No, it was not an amazing yeah. round, but when you're Greg Jackson, there you go. that's your fighter, that's what you say, because you do believe that she won the round, but it was a close round. And every fighter is, what they need to hear, obviously, is different fighter to fighter. <laughs> exactly. Close round leaning to Arlene Blanco. I would say the close round leans towards Arlene Blanco. Round two, ready? Round two, let's go, fight! Amazing talking to Arlene Blanco this week about her daughter now college age. And she didn't get to go to college, Arlene didn't, because she was pregnant with her daughter. Talk about starting a life in the fight game with two young children. That is some sacrifice. His body shots are starting to have an effect on that, and you see that he keeps on going back to the body with the right hand. Nice left hook over the top. You don't talk about fighters getting older and their hands getting quicker, no. but yet, Arlene Blanco was a nice right hand that landed as she went after her through the body. Right now, in the early part of the second round, you're seeing that Arlene is actually starting to expand that lead in her ability to touch Diana Silva without Diana landing the clean shot. She's seeing more opportunity now. Yep. Silva fought a very good fight against Julia Bunn, but 
John, you and I have been watching Julian Bud for years, and that is a fighter, a world-class fighter. The level of performance you're going to get from Julia Bud is all over the map. It is, because, you know, Julia fights to, a lot of times, to the level of performance, and she will slow a fight down, knowing, well, I can win this fight by just controlling my opponent, keeping her against the cage, bringing her down at times. She's a smart fighter, just that at times, you look and you just want more from her because she can be so dominant. <laughs> Overhand right has found a home now a couple of times here in round two. We're definitely seeing that both fighters are a little bit more open and slinging a little bit harder inside. Nice transition by Diana Silva to get underneath. Good wrestling defense, and here's what you're talking about. This is where all that wrestling comes in. She's got her hands locked. But Arlene has fought this off so far. Now talk to me about Arlene Blanco being over the shoulder of Diana Silva and the advantage now and later that comes with that. Well, right now, Diana Silva has the advantage. She's got double underhooks. She's able to control the body of Arlene, but Arlene now, you see how she's broken that? Now she's got one overhook. She's controlling the wrist. She can get an underhook if she wants, but she's not in a danger to be taken down with the positioning of Diana Silva right at this moment. She's worked herself out of a bad position in the stand-up. Now she's out. That right there shows a huge improvement in the wrestling game of Arlene Blenko and what she's been doing at Jackson Wing. Which allows her to bring the fight back to where she wants it to be. Where she's strongest. 931, 931 is going to be there. 931 is going to be there. Nice attempt with the high kick. She sees that Diana Silva sometimes is dipping her head towards her right. Diana Silva landing that low kick. You see that Arlene Blanco is trying to check it. Taking some of the sting off of it. Adding some sting back to it by himself. Nice body shot by Silva. Maybe the best shot of the round. The difference in this Arnold Blanco is always coming forward. Kicks a lot more here in round two, trying to set something up. Nice, Arlene. Believe in that energy. Silver shoot, not a chance. A nice knee inside on the exchange. Take that with you. One of the first lessons you taught me was that you can't score on defense. That's an example of where you can. She gets the takedown now, but just eight, seven, six, five seconds left in the round. Question is what difference does this take right. and do in the fight? No. Tomorrow, part of this big fight weekend, Ome Showtime Championship Boxing. This is truly history on the line. Jamel Charlo trying to become the first truly unified champion at 154. In his way, WBO Super Welterweight Champ Brian Castano. It's tomorrow night, 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific, live on Showtime. San Antonio. That's going to be a good one. It is. You know, we all grew up in different eras where there was one title or two titles, but now in the four belt era, unification seems almost impossible. And now here's a chance. Okay, the group, I like how long that. the level change, right? Take the 85 and take down. You got it? There's a little more flies behind your nine. A lot of talent right? in that family. Imagine. <laughs> so she's going to come out. Growing up hey, in the Charlo keep it house. Defense. Growing up in the Blenko house. Must have been interesting. Kayla, the daughter round, of college. Final round, good early, let's go. Fight. 13 year old son playing soccer now. <laughs> Goes around saying, My mom can beat up your mom. <laughs> and she's right. <laughs> <laughs> 
Fans got very excited about the Silva takedown, the final seconds of round two. Are we past the point where judges are swayed by things like that? Yeah, our judges are not going to be swayed by that takedown. A whole lot more taking place with that takedown for it to have a big impact on the round. Right now, I've got Odin Blanco winning this fight. 2018 doesn't mean that Vanna Silva cannot come back and take this fight. But right now, I believe she has to have a big round or finish the fight. She's only finished two of her opponents in 15 professional fights. Stepping up here in competition, she takes the left. That stunned him. Silva in big trouble. Yeah, she is in deep. The hammer fist from Anger Fist ended. That all started off the check of the kick. You saw Diana Silva throw the kick. Arlene checked it. Saw her take a step back, and then she got blasted with the hands. Beautiful, beautiful work by Arlene Blenko to finish that fight. Take a look at what happens here. That little check left hook, that hits hard. That right hand stuns her bad. She's in trouble. Look at her, she's wobbly. And then Arlene comes, hammer fist. That's an anger fist. Beautiful stoppage. That's exactly what Diana Silva needed to do. There's that check I was talking about. There comes the left hand, that stunned her. The right hand then puts her where she's wobbly on the legs. There's the anger fist. Outstanding finish by Arlene Blenko. World-class coaching and a world-class performance from Arlene Blenko. I'm so glad to be Her eighth win by knockout. And she is right back in the conversation. A game performance for Diana Silva, who has come into Bellator and faced two of the very best in Julia Budd and Arlene Blenko. Michael C. Williams makes it official. Inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end. One minute into round number three. The winner by TKO, Arlene. A lot of months, a lot of time away from her family. The dedication pays off. And Arlene Blenko back on the list, staring at Chris Cyborg is with Big John McCarthy. Arlene Blenko, congratulations on a beautiful performance. You started that fight. It was a good first round, but close. And you just started taking over as the fight went on. How are you feeling in here? I feel great. Um, firstly, thank you to my opponent, Diana. Um, Credit to her coming into the Bellator promotion and fighting number one and number two in the world. I wish you all the best um, in the future for your career. Um, I want to give a shout out to my kids at home, Kayla and Kian. I've been away from home um, for nine weeks. It's the longest I've ever been away from my kids. So Kayla and Kian, I love you and this is all for you. Um, for all my coaches and training partners back home in Australia, thank you for all the work you guys give me all throughout the year. Um, special shout out to these two men here. To all the um, coaches and training partners at Jackson Wink, you guys have been awesome and I'm glad to be part of the family. Um, my partner, Dion, he's come over here from Australia and um, literally sacrificed his job and soccer career to be here with me. Um, and obviously all my sponsors too. You guys, I wouldn't have been able to spend the last two months here in, Australia, um, in America if it wasn't for my sponsors. Sorry, all yours. There's nothing else we have to say. That was a great performance. Let's talk about the finish real quick. Mm -hmm. you, you checked that low kick that she threw and it kind of made her step back. Yep. And then you landed a beautiful left hand and then a big right hand that put her down. Yep. And then you went to those anger fists to finish her. <laughs> Did you know that once you hurt her with the left and the right that she was going to go? Yep. Um, yeah, I was just trying to gauge my distance. It was starting to be a little bit of a slow fight. Sorry, fans, I could hear you yelling, but I was determined to um, keep my pace and not rush in to anything. Um, we knew that she swung with power, that, that overhand right and that left hook came pretty quick. Um, but yeah, we've been working a lot on checks, so I know I'm going to have a lot of bruises tomorrow and hopefully her calf's a bit sore tomorrow too. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, it was a great performance. Congratulations on a comeback fight there. That was an outstanding win. Ladies and gentlemen, Anger Fist, Arlene Blanco. Not easy to do it all. She's a super mom.
So is Jen Brown. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, she said we were going to see Anger Fist 2.0. Malay Malay, what did you think of that performance? That was fantastic. She doesn't have to apologize to anybody. That was a textbook performance. She was patient. She waited for the opening. And I, lo I loved Arlene before, but I love Arlene 2.0. Got to love a class act there, too, giving her, uh, her opponent a lot of respect. Uh, looking forward to seeing her back in the cage. All right, well, showtime. They're going to deliver another weekend of back-to-back -back fight nights tomorrow. You're going to want to tune in to Showtime Championship Boxing because not one, but a historic four belts are on the line. Beneath the surface, Jamel Charlo churns. His unrest tied to his desire to stand alone. A pasar. On July 17th, an unyielding current will pull two men and four belts to San Antonio, where a piece of boxing history is ripe to be claimed. That's tomorrow night, 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific, only on Showtime. Well, what an amazing summer for boxing. Coming up, July 23rd, Showbox The Next Generation celebrates its 20th anniversary. Our undefeated super middleweight prospects Calvin Henderson and Isaiah Steen go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Then, August 14th, the WBO Bantamweight title is on the line. Guillermo Rigundo meets John Riel Casimero. And just announced this week, Boxing and MMA will collide once again in the next Showtime pay-per-view on August 29th. Now, professional boxer and internet sensation Jake Paul will take on former UFC champion Tyron Woodley. Uh, really looking forward to that one, guys. All right, well, now coming up next, two fighters hoping a dominant performance tonight will secure them a, span, a spot excuse me, into the Bantamweight division as CJ Hamilton, he's taking on Mateus Mato. So both of these fighters, guys, they faced Magomedov in their last fight. Now, one of those went to a decision. One was a finish. Is there anything, Josh, that we can take away from that and how it'll help us understand how these two match up tonight? No, because neither one of them are exactly like Magomed Magomedov, and neither one of these guys plan on wrestling. So I really believe they're going to end up standing in the center of the cage and banging after it. Now, Mato, so what he's going to do is he's going to make sure that he stands in front of him, stalks after him, throws big shots, and tries to land the killer shot. He will sprawl and brawl. C.J. Hamilton, what does he have to do? C.J. Hamilton has to use his movement, his quickness, his footwork. He's a very explosive fighter, has the reach advantage, obviously. And, you know, even though he is a Division One wrestler, I really don't think that he should use that against someone like Matos, who honestly was giving Magomed a hard time taking him down. So he has really good takedown defense. I think if C.J. is going to win this, he needs to keep it on the feet, needs to stay on the outside, get in, get out. This is where we disagree. I think Hamilton needs to mix in the wrestling a tiny bit, not use it all the time, but at least make Matos think about it to set up a stand-up. Well, Bellator President Scott Coker, he has already hinted about there being a Bantamweight Grand Prix in our future. There's a lot on the line for both of these men tonight. So let's get down to the action. Sean, back down to you. All right, Jen, and why wouldn't you, after A.J. McKee and Patricio Pitbull are set to meet in the Featherweight Grand Prix Final, there are plenty of names here at Bantamweight. The champion Sergio Pettis, Archuleta, Mix, Higo, Gallagher, Bagamedov, former champion Darian Caldwell about to add another name to that list. Ready now to make his way to the cage, CJ, the Autobot Hamilton. Too easy these days when you don't like somebody, just scream out fake news. But see, CJ Hamilton, he's got a legitimate right. And only one regret from his high school wrestling days that led to a story championship amateur career. That's what his coach told him, that women weaken legs. 
because he listened. <laughs> and while his social life may have been delayed, his wrestling, John, has always been on point. Wasn't that in a Rocky movie? Yeah, it's, I mean, she's still taking advice from Mickey Goldville at this point. I think <laughs> we've evolved. And now, making his way, Mateos Adamas Matos. They say martial arts jiu-jitsu and specifically can be pretty addictive. Tell that to Mateus Matus' older brother who found himself on the wrong end of a rear naked choke courtesy of his eight-year-old younger brother when he first tried it. Mom quickly put a stop to that, but eventually he found his way back. John, you have been in the cage with him. He's fought Peter Yan. He's worked with the Pitbull brothers. This is a dangerous fighter. He is a dangerous fighter. One of the things that makes him dangerous is he's very smart in the cage. He's relaxed. He doesn't have to win every moment of the fight. He knows that. He's very, very good at just being calm. Check out the tail of the tape here at Bantamweight. Big reach advantage there for C.J. Hamilton. 72-inch reach compared to a 67. That's something that Mateus Matos is very used to. We'll see if it makes a difference in this fight. To Michael C. Williams. From Mohegan Sun Arena Live on Showtime, Bellator MMA moves now to the Bantamweight division. Scheduled for three five-minute rounds. Introducing the blue corner at five foot six, weighing in 135 and one half pounds. His professional record: 15 wins, eight losses. From Hartwell, Georgia, CJ the Autobot Hamilton. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot five, weighing in 135 and three quarter pounds. As a professional, 12 victories, two defeats, one draw from Rio de Janeiro. He fights out of Macau, Rio Grande do Norte, Brazil. Introducing Mateos Adamas Matos. In charge, your referee, Kerry Petley. differently for how C.J. Hamilton should attack this fight. How do you see it? I, I'd have to agree with Josh on this one. I think he needs, that had to hurt you to I say do, that. It's like vinegar coming out of my mouth. But I do believe that he needs to use his wrestling to set up his hands, make him at least have to think about dealing with it. Like that. CJ in recovery because he got blasted there. Let's see if he's got all of his senses with him. Saw the impressive record for Matos, two losses. Akimedov, who we talked about earlier, and Peter Yan. Yeah. That was that was a great fight. <laughs> Peter Yan fight with Makamedov. You did that one, didn't you? I did, I, did, I did the second one they had. You know, yeah. They both have a win against each other, and uh, both of them are just outstanding Bantamweight fighters, which tells you how good Matos is. You can't go on YouTube. For, oh, look, here's, here's this fight in Chechnya. From, from, oh, is that <laughs> Yeah. Long ways to go to referee a fight. Nice Rich job, Mike. <laughs> This is what Alimale was talking about with CJ. Yes. He's very athletic, very dynamic. He needs to keep Matos off balance with that movement. It's Forrest Griffin and Rampage that lured CJ Hamilton, a lifelong wrestler, into the world of MMA. Talking to Mateus this week about the Pitbull brothers who are it's one thing to be a great fighter, a great fighter, and then a great coach. To do it at the same time, 
very unusual. Jorge Masvidal is like, he, he's got his fingerprints on so many different guys now, but you realize when he talks about the Pitbull brothers and the respect now, they just come with him. One of the things that happens with fighters is many times that they're really good at doing something, but they can't really tell you why. They can't really explain or coach someone into doing the same thing. Pitbull brothers, a little bit different, especially Patricio, he's very good at making someone understand what he does and how they can do the same thing. So it's like a podcaster, you're saying Josh should be a great coach. <laughs> That's exactly it. He has not found a home run. Right? Matos has gone for that a few times. Shots, everything that Hamilton threw, nothing landed though. Nothing that, it has to land on the scoring target. Yeah, we just talked to the other thing, some unnecessary movements. Yep. One of the things, if you're noticing, notice how Matos keeps CJ Hamilton's back towards the cage. That takes away one of the things that CJ can normally use, which is an in and out movement. He doesn't have the ability to do that. He can only go side to side. Talking about Pitbull and McKee. We're going to talk to AJ McKee coming up a little bit. We are closing in on July 31st. Matos really opened up. He took a shot there, though. Hamilton landed one good shot in there. He's swinging, wide. He's swinging for the fences. It's a lot of pressure that Montes is putting on Hamilton. We'll see what kind of effect that has on his cardio. Everything, all the hype and all the buzz that A.J. McKee has now, he has earned among the many extraordinary things about Patricio. Bellator goal right now, there's no argument about that. Is that He's a fighter who's been in some wars, and yet he is getting better in his age. Yeah, absolutely right. That is what it, that's the thing when you look at him and you look and go, man, he's better now than he was two years ago. And he's just learned how to be this efficient fighter inside the cage. He got in from Matos watching the Kings on Showtime. I've always thought of Patricio and Roberto Duran under that same umbrella. I always connected those two in my mind. They definitely have the same anger level. <laughs> Stop. Stop. CJ Hamilton kept it on the feet. Recovery, dude. Beautiful. Slow deep breath. Slow deep breath. Very in and out, slow deep breath. Get this was the back. most dangerous moment back. very early in the round. This was out. early in the slow round. Deep. This is where CJ slow gets deep. hit. Hey, that hey, beautiful hey. little check hey. left hook right there hey, lands. That's what I want right there. All we get then goes after touching. the guillotine. Okay. Keep touching. Don't try to Watch match the power. Boom. When you get in close, let me see some Put him on his okay. right. keister a little bit Just there, but touching. he wasn't that hey, hurt. That's why he was able to work his way out of the guillotine here and continue on in the round. Uh, yeah, yeah. Player, baby. Oh, oh, yeah. As as he's a little away, he's got kicks there. Good? You up for a Bantamweight Grand Prix? Oh, my God, yes, especially the Bantamweights. We have got so many good 135ers right now. It will be outstanding. All right, here Oliver, we go, he go, Brunson, man. Brunson, Darren Brunson, Caldwell Brunson. probably pop his head back in for that one. Patchy Mix is 14 and 1. Patchy Mix, Archuleta, the champion Pettis. We have got some studs. earlier during the prelims about how it's going to be amazing to get fans really back and have full buildings, but they've gotten used to hearing some things they never got to hear before. Some of, the, some of the things that people have heard from the coaching or even from the fighters themselves, 
As a referee, you used to hear things all the time. Some of the things you hear, they're funny, some of them are sad, but you're gonna hear things in that cage that you don't expect. Beautiful front kick by Montos. And right now, CJ is not implementing any type of offensive wrestling, and this is it's making Montos' life easy. All he's doing is sitting here dealing with a kickboxer right now, and right now he's being able to dominate the position, pick him apart. The idea of catching the ball. That's a big shot in left here. Hamilton in big trouble. And we're done. He survived the big shot in round one, but not here in round two. Pitbull brother product looked a lot like the Pitbulls in that performance. Right now, watch the left hand. Right hand goes the body. Watch the left hand right here. Uppercut. Big hit. Yeah. Uppercut brought his head up. Left hand seals the deal. He is hurt. That's why he's covering up. Matos just opens up. Yeah, he's hitting the glove, but that brain is getting rattled. Watch here again. To the body, uppercut comes up with that left hand. That's the one that puts him down. That's the one that hurts him. And there's intelligent defense, and there's defending your life. Yeah. <laughs> That's what that, that was the fight stopping second one. When you're looking at this, when we talk about, you know, the difference between TKO, KO. A TKO is going to be when you are not intelligently defending yourself. A KO is when you cannot. Big difference. Right here, he can, but he's not. This is going to be called a TKO. Okay, here we go. Here we go. 13 and 2, seventh cool. knockout win. And that Bantamweight division gets more crowded by the day. The Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, it comes to an end officially. One minute, 33 seconds into round number two. The winner by TKO do Brasil, Mateus Adamo. Well, guys, we're talking about a Bantamweight Grand Prix. I think we just got another name on the list. Absolutely. Hey, picking up a seventh knockout. Josh, I asked you if you wanted to talk about it. You said absolutely. What'd you think? There was a word in the I know, I'm not going to say that word. We are in showtime, though. What else do you think? Absolutely. <laughs> Look, this man possesses the power, the pressure, the conditioning we saw with Magomedov, where he was able, he kept getting taken down. But in the third round, he kept trying to get after him. He kept trying to finish the fight. He's got two losses, one to Magomed, Magomedov, and one to Peter Yan. I'm just letting you know right now, he has put the Bantamweight division on notice, and if Scott Coker decides to do the Bantamweight tournament, I cannot imagine him not being at least in that semifinals to final area. This guy is a stud, and I cannot wait to watch him come in and fight every single time. No one he comes from the Pitbull camp, and they every time come to deliver. Just like they said, I mean, he even looks like one of the Pitbull brothers. So, yeah, he can be the representative in the Bantamweight division. Well, it was a fantastic performance. Can't wait to see uh, where he falls in the rankings potentially next week. All right, well, we started with 16 of the best featherweights in the world, and in over a little over two weeks a winner will be crowned now the victor goes home with a belt a world title and a million dollars let's take a look at how we got there. welcome to bellator mma's featherweight world grand prix selection show here we go aj mckee flawless victory december let's get it whoever won it winner winning chicken dinner i'm ready to cook them up in a pot aj you make sure you bring that skillet boy because i'm about to spread on your ass who wants you fight me I think everybody wants to fight him. You are a loser. Pedro Cavallo. All right. The bracket is locked, loaded, and ready to launch. Here we go. To the bottom. Oh, the tap out. McKee forces Derek Campos to capitulate. It's the round goes on. It's the Treat 
Lucio Pitbull remains the featherweight world champion. Patricio Pitbull, AJ McKee, will battle to determine who will win the $1 million bonus check and who will be able to claim themselves the greatest featherweight. And the best pound-for-pound -pound fighter in Bellator, not just now, but in company history. That's what's on the line on July 31st. He is 26 years old. He is undefeated. He is one win away from the top of that mountain. AJ McKee joins us now. Man, July 31st is like Christmas morning to fans of this sport. I imagine you are probably jumping out of bed every day knowing it's getting close. Man, I'm so eager. I can't wait. I'm counting the days as we speak. Uh, I'm, I'm more than ready. Can't wait, you know. Um, I can't even really put words into, uh, into aspect of how I feel. I just I want to get in there and get it over with already. Well, you've never been shy with words. Five years ago, we were at the Pond in Anaheim. You were the opening fight on that show, and you won. I want to say it was the fifth win to go to 5-0. and And when we asked you what was next, we're thinking, well, he'll name somebody. You were talking about Patricio Pitbull five years ago, and it almost seems to me you have been preparing for this night and for this fight from your first day in Bellator. I have, and that's the crazy part, you know. I feel like Patricio at first, he kind of, thought of it as like okay this is that young kid just talking smack and wanting the opportunity at my title but i've i've genuinely been prepared and been preparing for him since day one you know he's been that champ since i first stepped foot in what he calls his cage so um now it's time just to go in there have fun and uh, make it my cage take over the game well, you have told us for five years and you certainly told us over the last year that you were going to be the one to beat patricio so the question is how where will you succeed where so many others have failed against him um, I just feel my reach, my range, my speed, my power. I'm younger, I'm faster, I'm stronger. Um, obviously, cage awareness is key. Um, we both have great cage awareness. Over the years, I've come to learn a lot more inside of the cage. Um, so I, I feel like that's going to be my strong point. Um, can't give you all the sauce on how I'm going to do it, but I know exactly how I'm going to do it. <laughs> Earlier this week, Vlad Guerrero Jr. was the MVP of the All-Star Game. Fernando Tatis Jr. is one of the top stars in Major League Baseball. We can't have this conversation without talking about your dad, your coach, your best friend for so many years. He was a very good fighter. I want to say he was 25-3 and three at one point, but never had the same opportunities that a lot of his contemporaries had. If it goes your way on July 31st, if you become the champion, how much of that is the two of you together? And it's awesome, you know. I, I go into my dad's house every day and I look at, we have a just kind of a poster of where he's plastered on the wall and he's got his world title. So my little brother at three years old comes in and he sees that poster and then we got a picture that's hand painted of me and there's no title yet, you know what I mean? So for me, it gives me an incentive like, man, this is a, a family tradition, a family legacy that you got to continue and, and just go out there and leave your, your first stamp on the game, you know, introduce the world to who A.J. McKee is because the last name McKee has already been reigning in mixed martial arts for many years now. So um, getting to come back full circle and, and get the last name McKee, the respect and recognition it deserves all together is being one of the greatest last names in the sport. AJ, you're a next generation fighter in a sport that still in many ways is in its infancy. You and I have had conversations before about the NBA, about the, the quote unquote big four sports. Does a featherweight championship, does a world championship, does a pound for pound best in Bellator for AJ McKee, can you become a guy that crosses over into that, the rest of the sports world? Definitely, definitely. I feel like, um, it's gonna, this is gonna separate me from any other ordinary fighter. Being undefeated, being young, and being a world champion, and dethroning Bellator's overall best pound for pound fighter. And I feel like one of the best pound for pound fighters in the world, you know? It's gonna put a real stamp on who I am and 
I'm, I'm really looking forward to it, man. He's a champ champ. I mean, four or five years ago, I was saying I was going to become, become a champ champ before Connor did it. And then having multiple people do it afterwards. Um, that's an accolade I'm looking forward to conquering and, and doing myself. So, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, it, it's going to be great. You're not the only one looking forward to it, my friend. We'll see you on July 31st. Everyone will be watching. Yes, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. AJ McKee joining us. I met AJ McKee, fun story, in 2015 before his second professional fight, and even then he was already talking about becoming a world champion. And not five minutes later, I met another fighter going into her second professional fight. She didn't talk that day about becoming a world champion, but she became one two years later. And now Josh, Jen, Aline Malay McFarland is sitting next to you, and you guys all get to weigh in on this fight that all of us are just counting the days and the hours until we get to see. I mean, it really is hard to believe that we are just a little over two weeks away from this uh, amazing match of crowning the winner. Aline Malay, when you looked at this Bantamweight, uh, excuse me, the uh, Featherweight Grand Prix, did you think these two would be in the finals? Is this how you saw it playing out? I, don't, I not only thought that they were going to be in the finals, but I wanted them to be in the finals. I mean, just like Sean said, that, that story gave me chicken skin. Um, that, you know, me and AJ, we kind of came up together. We started in Bellator at the same time. We were both undefeated. I won the belt. Now it's his turn to win the belt. So I am totally going for AJ. This was the fight that was supposed to happen. I can't wait for it. All right, well, coming up next in our co-main event, it is the heavyweights, Tyrell Fortune, who started his pro career here at Bellator. On a tear, he won eight straight before he lost to Tim Johnson. Now he's 10 and one. He's working his way up the rankings tonight. He faces a veteran in Matt Mitrione. Now, when we talked to these guys this week, uh, Josh, the, the one thing that I didn't know and we learned was that Harold Fortune was Matt Mitrione's wrestling coach for almost two years when he was at the Black Zillions. So let me ask you, because you fought a friend before in Gilbert Melendez, is it hard to fight a friend? Is it hard to punch a friend in the face? Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. You do it all the time in the gym and that's part of training right so what's different than us getting paid to do it when it really matters and the other thing as well is when it comes down to it the filling out process is already over. I know how hard he hits. I know how fast he is. I know that he can wrestle. Obviously, Matt Mitrione knows that Tyrell Fortune can wrestle. And Matt knows also that what he needs to do to beat him. Now, I'm sure things have changed over the years. Okay? Like, they have evolved as fighters. Matt, you know, is, is probably still learning how to stay off his bike. But he said he spent a lot of time in Purdue wrestling for this specific fight. So we're going to see if it all pays to... Pays to uh, if it pays, pays off. If it pays off in this fight. So if this is the case, he's got to stick and move stay on the outside. Tyrell Fortune, though, he just got to utilize his wrestling. Yeah, I mean, like you said earlier, Tyrell is one of those fighters, those wrestlers, rather, that has fallen over his hands. But I don't think Mitrione is the opponent where you should test that theory out. I think if Tyrell sticks to his wrestling and, uh, you know, I, I also I'm curious to see if they're really going to try to punch each other hard. I know uh, Mitrione at least said earlier this week that he doesn't want to hit him too hard. He'd rather go to the judges' scorecard. So we'll see if these guys really try to knock each other out or if Tyrell tries to just take him down, beat him by the cards. Well, Matt Mitrione's got knockout power. We've seen it before. We've seen him stick and move. He's got a fast jab. He comes in straight. He's got great ground power when he gets on top. Now, I don't know how he plans on getting on top of Tyrell Fortune, but I'm telling you right now, the speed of his hands and the athleticism. This is the guy who played in the NFL, played for the New York Giants. He's an athletic person for such a big body. And when he starts touching you up, he knows how to finish. Like you see with Fedor, they both dropped each other, but he was the first one to get back to his feet to get to the top position and finish Fedor Emelianenko. He is an athlete. He is someone that can stick and move. Tyrell Fortune is also an athlete. But Matt just needs to stay on the outside, pick him apart, use the long lengthiness of his hands and his legs to push kick, leg kick, use the jab, snap it in his face. Make Tyrell question whether he wants to shoot or if he wants to stand. If he does that, he might have a successful night. Well, Tyrell, look, he's got that world-class uh, wrestling pedigree. We know about it, but he's got seven knockouts, right? You know, he says that he wants to stand and trade. So is that the right game plan against Matt Mitrion? Is, is using that wrestling and showcasing that knockout so power? I, I, I believe that he needs to mix it up, like I had said earlier about one of the other fights. You, you got that one. I'll give you that, Josh. <laughs> is that he, needed, he needs to utilize both. And I'm not saying that he needs to go out there and just hang out on the leg and keep forcing the takedown. No. What he needs to do is set up his hands and his wrestling together. If he starts fainting the takedowns, that'll set up what you see right there. Beautiful knockout power. He's got power. He's got speed. He can get in there. But the takedowns will help set that all up. And when he started to get away from that and he thought
thought he would just stand, he ran into someone named Tim Johnson. And Tim Johnson was like, look, I know how to stuff takedowns, I know how to throw power, and he got caught. Now, with him, all he's got to do is utilize the wrestling and set up his hands. And I think he makes it a hard and difficult night for Matt Mitrione if he does that. And Mitrione is a southpaw. Easy snatch single for Tyrell. So we'll see if he utilizes that. Well, uh, there's one looming question uh, out there is that is who is going to face Fedor Emelianenko over in Russia in October? Now, a big win tonight. It certainly keeps Matt in those discussions. A lot on the line for both of these men. So uh, let's get to it. Sean, Big John, back down to you guys. Hey, Big John, you've known, you consider Josh a friend. You've often said you want to punch him in the face. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Story as old as MMA itself. The older fighter has been at the highest level for years, and the younger one that wants his spot. On his way now to the cage, Matt Mitrion. Be a simple kind of man. Be something you love and understand. Matt Mitrione doesn't just talk that Leonard Skinner talk as he walks to the cage and has for years. He walks that walk in real life, too. But he handles his career with the same simplicity, the same honesty as he certainly did in the press conference this week. And he'll tell you flat out he got out wrestled and beaten by Ryan Bader. But the Tim Johnson lost, John. He's got some issues with that one. Well, he does have some issues with the Tim Johnson loss because he actually had a... Uh, Clash of the heads is what put him down, and he wasn't able to recover from that. That was the end, end of the fight. We'll show it to you right now. You can see, watch boom. You see how Tim used his head to come inside. Watch Matt. You can see the the actual touch of that head on his chin. It moves his head. That's what put him down. And this was basically the last time that Matt Mitchell was on his feet in this fight. So he does have some kind of you know argument that. An illegal action, if the referee had seen that, they would have stopped the fight, given him time. That's not what happened, and he ended up getting the loss. And now, on his way to the cage, Tyrell Fortune. Ironic that Tim Johnson is the one that took the zero from Terrell Fortune, but he has been through plenty enough. That's not the kind of thing that is going to bother him. What is so fascinating to me about this thing we've been talking about all night, about him coaching Matt Mitrione, is that as his wrestling coach, wrestling was his downfall against Ryan Bader. To have known each other, as you see, there's a lot of respect there. Is this an issue when you're fighting a friend? No, absolutely not. This is business. You're make, this is how you make your living. And although Matt says, oh, he doesn't want to hit him too hard, Matt's lying because as soon as he gets hit, <laughs> he's going to hit him as hard as he can. Now the tail of the tape, we always get that disparity. You can get it off of that heavyweight and we have it here. Our tail of the tape for this, take a look at the weight. Tyrell Fortune being one of the, what we talked about, those hybrid he heavyweights, 233.5. Matt Mitrione, he looks good. This is one of the heaviest weights that he's come in the Bellator cage. We'll see if it works for him. Bellator MMA now presents tonight's co-main event, three five-minute rounds in the heavyweight division. And now, live on Showtime, we introduce the blue corner. At six foot three, weighing in 261 pounds even, his professional record, 13 wins, eight losses, by way of Springfield, Illinois. He fights out of West Lafayette, Indiana, presenting Matt Mitrio. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at six foot two, weighing in 233 and one half pounds, near perfect as a professional. Ten victories, just one defeat, fighting out of Tempe, Arizona. He hails from Portland, Oregon, Tyrell Fortune. In charge, your referee, Dan Bergliano. and you've got the specter of the Fedor fight in October. All 
of these stakes sort of floating in the atmosphere and two guys that have issues with Tim Johnson, too. <laughs> well, both of them like another shot at Tim Johnson. Don't know if that's going to happen. But one of the things you'll see with Mitrion, he's got a lot of in and out movement, back and forth. He does keep his hands low, and so watch for the timing of Tyrell. There you go. Into that takedown. At the start, he's already he had the headbutt. He, he did. He's screaming out for the headbutt. Exactly in the same spot that he was, and we just talked about with Tim Johnson. But instead of right now yelling out as a headbutt, he needs to just protect himself, get himself out of this position. I'm not saying he did not get actually a head clash with that. It was a more of a tackle by Tyrell Fortune. This is the heavy ride. Let's see right here. He ducks his head. But see, that was created by Matt Mitrione ducking his head into Tyrell Fortune's head. So when he's the one that created that, that's continue on. Question we have been talking about amongst ourselves this week. Ryan Bader had 15 minutes of this to get this Tyrell Fortune have that. Take a look at this. You see Tyrell Fortune coming in, but you see Matt Mitrione is the one that creates that head clash by coming down into him. So it's over. That's it. And again, a head clash does Matt Mitrione in. Decision. Here's what happens. You see Tyrell Fortune, he comes, all of a sudden he changes levels, he drops down, and he comes in to get this takedown, but it's Matt Mitrione that actually dips down in and creates that head clash. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not an illegal action, but it's not illegal by Tyrell Fortune. Fortune didn't do anything. It was actually Matt Mitrione that created that. If the referee had seen it, he could have stopped it. But that's not what occurred. And Matt Mitrione is going wild right now because he's looking up at the God screens and he's seeing the clash of heads. And he is screaming at Dan Mergliano right now. This was just 10, 15 seconds ago. Well, you can see he's not mad at, at Tyrell Fortune at all. He no. feels that he got headbutted and that created a problem for him, a problem that he would not have been in, and he was wanting the referee to see that. It wasn't seen, and that's why the fight was let go. Tyrell Fortune does his job and fights through it. He goes to 11 and one. He moves up the list at heavyweight. But the conversation of this one will continue. Let's first make the decision official for Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, the tap ends at officially one minute, 45 seconds in round number one. The winner, Tyrell Fortune. The conversation on both sides of this one will be interesting. Let's hear from the winner. Tyro Fortune. There was a clash of heads. You went for the takedown. He dipped down into your head, and he's the one that created. Did you feel that clash? No, I didn't feel it at all. I was running through him, so I didn't know what happened. That's why I told him, you know, I didn't mean that. Accidental contact. It was unintentional as far as what occurred as far as the head clash. Let's talk about when you got on the ground with him. He started covering up, but then you started, he tried to move, you used heavy hips to keep him down on the ground, and just keep on going until the rep pulled you off. First priority was control, and then look for the shots to get him when they were open. Right now, you've been in a couple of rematches, you just had a big win against Matt. Who is it that you're looking at that you would want to fight next? Tim Johnson, bring your ass here, boy. Tim Johnson's already had, you've had a fight with him. He has a win against you. That was your only loss. Tell me why you want to face him again. Because that's my only loss. Only reason why. Sounds good to me. Well, congratulations on a big win. Ladies and gentlemen, your winner, Tyrell Fortune.
refreshing is how many times are we here? Oh, I don't know. Whoever Bellator wants to give me, Terrell Fortune is a man with a plan, and he wants to get that win back from Tim Johnson. He does his job tonight. He goes to 11 and 1. And guys, I mean, talk about lightning striking twice. Bellator MMA proud to share the screen with Showtime's critically acclaimed premium entertainment. Let's see what's coming up on Showtime. It is time to do something differently. This is another eco trip for you. What? What? You finished? We are locked down. We need to be calm and quiet. You did not say that confidently. Let's get it! We had the Church of Comedy, boy! Congratulations, gentlemen. Y'all blew up. Ah! There is a lot of mystery behind us and a lot of unanswered questions that no one wants to talk about. We need to do everything we can to try to figure things out. We must remain curious. People like us need power to feel alive. Maybe even to be alive. Indeed. You know the feeling of power. Could you handle it or would it devour? I told you never to come to my place of work. Lock them up and shut them down. When I compete, I'm gonna win. Game's not over, buddy boy. Vengeance will be happy. You're a monster. You know the feeling of power. Well, Bellator 262 continues here at the Mohegan Sun in Uncasville, Connecticut. We have had four incredible fights, and it is time for our main event of the evening. Now, Juliana, Juliana Velasquez will defend her belt for the first time against five-time world kickboxing champion Denise Keelholtz. Now, Alimale, you defended your belt four times before you had to relinquish it. Was the first title defense different than the others? It was. I mean, I've sold, I've fought in front of sold-out arenas in my hometown, oh, screaming crowds, the but the fight that I felt the most pressure for was my first title defense. And what's the saying goes, that you're not a real champion until you defend your belt. Now, there's no telling if that's how Juliana feels as well, but I will tell you that that first title defense is much different from the rest. Look at she's undefeated. She's 11-0. She's never tasted defeat. How does she keep that perfect record intact tonight? She's got to go in there and fight confidently. I don't think she has a problem doing that. But I think that she needs to go out there, put pressure on Denise right off the bat. I'm not saying she needs to rush in and clinch. What I think is she needs to make Denise move around and she needs to dictate where this fight goes. If she can do that, sticking the jab in the face, using long kicks, if she can do that, I think she can control where Denise fight, takes this fight. Okay, I agree, and I like that you said she can't rush in because as we've seen in Denise's previous fights, her opponents that did rush in were dropped to the ground instantly. So I agree with you for once, Josh, that Juliana needs to keep it on the outside, but keep the pressure on, use that long jab that she likes, which she has stuffed me with, and including the front kick that she's really good at. Well, let's talk about Juliana because, you know, she's got that judo background, but she's had a lot of success in the stand-up as well, Josh. Because she possesses the power, and she is a southpaw, which makes it more difficult for, for females to deal with her. Because of the southpaw, the reach as well, the length, those are things that people have to learn how to get into. Denise Kilholtz can do that because she has the experience of doing that. Juliana just needs to stick that straight left. She needs to touch her with the jab and come back one, two, and three punches in a row. She can't just throw one and two. She did that a lot against you, Alina Lay, and she has success, but against someone like Denise, who's a little bit more refined on the feet in terms of the kickboxing, she needs to make sure that she's throwing more than ones and twos, because Denise will slip and counter really well. Well, Denise, she also is a black belt in judo. She's got that world-class kickboxing, but, you know, I'm curious of how you think she is going to stylistically match up against uh, Velasquez here, Limele, because uh, Velasquez is a tough person to figure out, as you know. Yes, I, I know. I obviously didn't crack the code to her either but uh you know this was the matchup to make these two are the top two strikers in the division i'll go ahead and say that on paper as well so this was the matchup that we've all been waiting for on top of that they do have black belts in judo which we haven't truly seen from juliana quite yet we have seen uh magnificent head throws and control on the ground with a beautiful arm lock finish that denise loves to do so i'm really excited to see if this fight does go to the ground. 
I'm sitting there watching her hit pads, and I'm thinking, man, I wish I had that power when I was fighting. <laughs> it's nasty. She cracks the pads. You can see she was fighting another um, another kickboxer in, in that fight there, and she pieced her up quickly as she got rushed in. Now, her submission game has come a long way. She is very good at throws, getting the fight to the ground, but where she has made the most improvements is getting to the back, getting on the neck. She is physically strong, as you can see in both the submissions, as well as when you just saw her hitting pads. She She's got power. She possesses it in both hands. You just saw right there with the, uh, Jackson. She touched her, boom, boom, puts the combinations together. She doesn't just throw ones and twos a little bit like Juliana Velasquez does. That's where the problem, I think that's not the problem. I think that's where she, her strengths lie. If she's able to slip and throw in a three and four punch combination, Juliana's going to have her hands full tonight. Absolutely. When you talk about that power, you know, when we talked to Keel Holtz this week, she said the person that I like to emulate is Mike Tyson. She said, why throw something at 50% when I can throw it at 100%? Well, you just saw her on the pads. She looked like <laughs> I know. Mike Tyson. Well, the question is, is will her 100% uh, damage the champ tonight? And we are about to find out. Sean, back over to you. All right, guys, it was a half decade of dominance for Alima Lay ending here last December when Juliana Velasquez did take that throw. Now her first title defense, you guys said, comes against a world champion striker who had to start all over again in MMA and whose story teaches us that necessity is the mother of reinvention. Some fight for fame. I'm taking over everybody. Everybody. Some fight for fortune. The winner will walk away with one million dollars. While others fight for family. You know, also I want to dedicate this fight to my mom. I wouldn't be nothing without you. Take Juliana Velasquez, Bellator's reigning flyweight world champion. Every time she steps foot in the cage, she holds the memory of her older brother, Rafael, close to her heart and has remained unbeaten in her professional career. It is all over! Juliana Velasquez! That was it! Yeah. Growing up in Rio de Janeiro, Juliana and Rafael were extremely close. Whether it be at play or in the dojo, the two were inseparable. Velasquez jumped into combat sports at a young age, finding early success on the judo mat. After failing to make the Brazilian Olympic team, Juliana broadened her talents to mixed martial arts. But everything came crashing down in 2016 when Rafael tragically lost his life. Since then, she's dedicated every victory to her only sibling and guardian angel. Ele que me emociona, ele que me faz querido tal o tempo inteiro. Quando me sinto fraca no treino, eu olho pro meu braço, pra minha tatuagem e me falo que ele tá aqui, eu tenho certeza que a gente tá Juliana's opponent enters tonight's main event with a different purpose. Denise Kielholz, the pride of Amsterdam, fights to pull off the rare feat of becoming a multi-combat sport champion. Next to my blue belt, I want also the red belt. Kielholz found her passion in the kickboxing ring racking up 47 wins in 50 professional fights. Miss Dynamite, Bellator's current kickboxing world title holder, has made the jump from ring to cage and now rides a four-fight MMA win streak, looking to capture another belt under the Bellator bench. How good was that, Miss Dynamite? Juliana Velasquez's powerful love for family meets Denise Kielholt's drive for combat sports supremacy in our main event. And now, the challenger, ready to make her way to the cage, Miss Dynamite, the knees, Keelholz. So now, you know the story, how she give, had to give up the life she knew to compete at the highest level of MMA, but it wasn't the first time. Because there are very few roles in life more unappreciated than the stepmom. But becoming one, another life curveball that she hit out of the park. Another new role she mastered to that 14 year old Osher off to. She's become a bonus mom and a hero. Josh, what I'll ask you is what does she have to do tonight to reach the top of yet another sport? 
Right now, what Denise needs to do is just be who she is. Be that aggressive stand-up fighter. If the fight hits the ground, be that person that's going after the submissions. You know, everyone looks at all these th the things she does. She's got a lot of submissions with her knockouts. Her keys to victory are very simple. She needs to command the center of the cage. Don't put your back against the fence. Your timing, your distance, and your control are always outstanding. Use them again. Well, she lights up every room she is in, but when she steps into the cage, everything about her changes. Set now to make her way to the cage, the defending Bellator Flyweight World Champion, Juliana Velasquez. title you don't often see a three inch reach height advantage in a championship fight at the same weight yeah you know at, at five foot six compared to five foot three the one thing i'm going to say with this a lot of people look at that and go wow that's a big difference denise has been fighting taller fighters her entire career this is normal it is main event time it is world title time it is michael c williams time bellator mma live on showtime from mohegan sun arena the time has come for the main event of the evening five five minute rounds for the bellator flyweight world championship sanctioned by the mohegan tribe department of athletic regulation chairman james gessner president of sports and entertainment mr tom cantone chief of the mohegan tribe lynn malerva and supervising at cave side director mike mazuli and now, first introducing the blue corner. At five foot three, weighing in 124 pounds even, the reigning Bellator kickboxing flyweight world champion tonight looks to make history as she enters her first MMA world title fight, bringing six professional victories, two defeats. She hails from Amsterdam, Holland, introducing the challenger, the knees, Miss Dynamo. And across the cage, the champion fights out of the red corner at five foot six, weighing in 125 pounds. In her first defense of her world title, she stands undefeated. 11 victories, no defeats from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, presenting the defending Bellator Flyweight World Champion, Juliana Alaska. Charge Kevin McDonald. All right, ladies, this is five rounds under the unified rules of mixed martial arts for the belt. We went over those rules in the back. If you'd like touch gloves now, best of luck. If you can't feel that stare down through your set, through your device, adjust it. <laughs> Let's go. The world's 
title defense versus history. John, when the fight started against the Lima Lay, the first thing that struck me was how much bigger Juliana Velasquez was. Now against Denise Gilho, it's just, it jumps off the screen. It's even more. Yeah, yeah, that's dramatic. But again, Denise is used to fighting a bigger, longer opponent. Juliana is the one, if she can control the distance, this is a big moment for her just to see how she deals with the speed of Denise Gilho. Big rush inside by Denise, a little bit wild. said over and over again how she had to evolve her game to these skill holds. Where is the area of most significant improvement from five years ago when she first started? Well, what she does is she, first off, her defense is much different. What she used to do is a defensive kickboxing doesn't work with MMA based upon the gloves and the takedowns, so she's changed that up. The other thing she's done is she has really decided to sit down on her punches. She throws very hard in MMA compared to where she just tries to touch in kickboxing. So she's really into throwing big, heavy shots. That did miss by much. See, Velasquez doesn't just circle out. She circles right back to the middle. They're adding the southpaw element here with Velasquez, too. Which can make for an awkward fight sometimes or a very explosive one. Anytime you're going to get that battle of that foot, you see that lead foot on both fighters, be it the left foot or the right foot, it is a battle to put that foot to the outside so your strong power hand goes straight down the fight. Skill holds the more active fighter here in the first half of round one. Juliana has been very way off on the You see her looking for the counter. She's trying to counter, but the speed of what Denise is throwing at times is giving her a little bit of trouble. She's trying to get out of the way and then set, her, set herself back and just is not able to, to get that distance down. Which begs the question we've been asking since this fight was first announced. Why would Juliana Velasquez insist that she's misleading all of us? Hasn't for three plus minutes. Why would she want the fight here? She believes in her stand up, and you got you know, There's no way that you can argue with her. She has been simply dominant with being a stand up fighter in MMA. So she believes in herself. She's being right. One of the other things you'll notice about Denise, coming from a kickboxing and Muay Thai background, in MMA, she has really decided to just cut down on the kick. She does not kick that often. She'll do those low calf kicks every now and then. She'll come up with a head kick, but she has cut her kicks probably 75%. Fishing, as you see, even with the low volume. One of the many most, the most impressive thing, and there are a lot of them about the these skills, is that reinvention sounds like, oh, that's the plan. You gotta reinvent. That's a very difficult thing to do, and those are big shots from these skills. That was nice. She landed a two-punch combo in there. She missed a couple, but two of those landed clean. A puzzling opening round here from the champion. You can see the damage that Denise Gilles has done. He swings for the fences. In MMA, she puts everything into it. A good start to round one for the challenger, an even better finish.
Looking forward to Showtime Sports lineup this summer. Here's how you'll never miss a fight. Five minutes into this world championship fight. John, we're asking the same questions we've been asking for weeks. <laughs> it's true. You know, it, it, the one thing you can't then say is that Juliana was lying. She said, I'm going to yep. stand with her, and that's what she's doing. But look at this combination. That's a beautiful right hand. Left Back hand touches the, line, the forehead. Please. Right hand touches again. That's actually Outside a three-punch combination. I missed one of those. Nothing that bad, but it's enough to set her back, and it's making her think about, ooh, how do I get my hands on her? Juliana Velasquez's run has been amazing because before the title win, she beat Bruna Allen, she beat Christina Williams. A vicious knockout of a very tough Rebecca Ruth. No one had speed with their hands like Denise Gilhoff does. That is the one thing about Denise. You know, we talk about it all the time. Speed kills, and she is fast. When she wants to go, she's got quick hands, and she normally throws right down the pipe. She's been swinging outside a lot against Juliana here. Think trying to add a little bit more just juice on that shot. Juliana Velasquez is one and done because she doesn't want to get in too close. She tried to circle away. She got the right in. See it right there. That that tells you that Juliana is not saying anything that she would not mean. I'm going to stand up with her. She has the ability to get her hands on her. She just continues to circle out. Doesn't even think about it. She wants this to be a stand-up battle. Well, that was a good use of the jab and a good use of her length compared to Denise Gilholtz, but she needs to be more active with that. He said a lot of people pointing to the fact that Denise Gilholtz has racked up some submission wins during this win streak, good short right. But those came after she knocked the living daylights out of whoever she was fighting and then went to the ground. Which is not a bad idea, and you see it a lot. You'll see a fighter use their hands, get you know a good shot, and hurt their opponent. And then, as the opponent hits the ground, they go and get, go after the submission. Now, Juliana Velasquez is looking a little more comfortable. It was her best combination. She's using that right hand. That jab is coming out. She's not trying to you know load up on it, but she's just sticking it in Denise's face, and it's landing. Gonna set up her other shots. There's no question who has owned the center of the cage. Most of the time when you're seeing Juliana fight, she's the one that is basically marching her opponent down. That is not happening here tonight. I'm, I'm not sure you've seen the footprint of Denise Gillis outside the circle till now, and that left got in. She's been a lot more effective with that jab, which is helping her left hand find a home. Right got through, she had just blocked the kick to kill her. Eat that right jab. Here's the first level change. Not even close. Beautiful job of stuffing it by Denise. That's going to give Denise confidence. Strikes, you can see 17 of 61 for Kielholtz. Now we're at 9 of 45 for Velasquez and 9 of 51 for Denise. Yes, 
Goes through the mind of Juliana Velasquez when the first level change went nowhere. Talk about gaining confidence for Denise Gilhos. Does it do the opposite to the champion? Well, it can if, you, if you, you're actually going for that and thinking you were going to get it. You get just stonewalled like she did. That is not a good feeling. As as, Ooh, something that you, did, you thought might work for you and then you just got basically out around it. She's done a very good job with that jab, and I think she's winning this round based upon that jab. The third, final 30 seconds of a close round two. Oh, it was a good right hand by Denise. Oh. Overhand left, Juliana much more comfortable here. The like range to, around two. Yeah, I'd like to see Denise open up with a low calf kick on that lead leg. Juliana puts a lot of weight forward. for the champion. He leads one at the bell. Up to the bank, to the bank. What's the biggest difference here in round two for the champion? Round two for the champion, she, she was able to establish the jab. Watch the jab here. Just that little, see how now Denise's shots go off based upon that jab connecting. Kielholz comes up, gets inside. Normally, when she gets inside, she gets a little bit better base. She was able to land, but she was a little bit off balance with those. And again, that jab followed by the straight left down the middle was just a better round overall. You can see part of that damage, Denise is starting to wear it. Even through two. Back behind I line. have it even through two right now. Let's go. Velasquez had never been past round three until her title win. Nice job of going to the body with the right hand on the knees. Yeah, I'd really like to see Denise kind of attack that lead leg. You can see when Juliana stepped forward, she's putting a lot of weight on that leg. That's getting a little wilder than we're used to see. Even Denise, the first rush of the fight, she came in a little wilder than you'd think. She's having problems with the length of range of Juliana. It's frustrating her a little bit. And now that she's getting hit with that jab, it just adds another problem to the equation. Talking over and over about how Juliana Velasquez has been reticent to go to plan B. But at least her plan B is more significant than these guild houses would be. <laughs> Very strong start in round one for the challenger. Jab. Low kick from Juliana Velasquez has kind of changed the tempo. And she's getting in and out like that. So Juliana doing a good job of just sticking that jab out there. And you're seeing that Denise is trying to really load up and land the big shot here. Juliana doing a very nice job of just stepping back, circling out. Champ was not lying. Not at all. You can see Denise is starting to, to, that left eye is starting to swell up a lot because of that jab.
that's what you need to see from Denise. What she's going to do, she needs to slide her feet in. Figure out exactly which way you think that Juliana's going to go and slide your feet towards you so those punches land. Mix it up with the back fist. The champion, something else to think about. She's gone to that spinning back fish, and you be careful not to go to the well too many times with those type of techniques. Number two. Alaska is now much more comfortable getting in close. Her confidence is growing. You can see it here as this fight gets older. said is that in her fight, Juliana talked one way before the fight. She's going to take a lot of chances and then didn't. Here she's done exactly what she told us for weeks that she was going to do. Yeah, absolutely. She's following the game plan she talked about. Staying on her feet, using movement. She's basically got that timing down now. She's using that jab as a measure. Coming straight down the middle. Nice knee up inside. I don't know if it really hit, but definitely took the knees off balance a little bit. It kept her at bay. Yep. Even if it didn't score, it stopped the offense. There's the level chip. He quickly pulls her into the guard. Final seconds of the round. <laughs> Through three to the championship rounds we go, and to the former champion we go. Alimba, we really thought Denise Gilholz had a strong start in this fight and was sort of implementing her game plan. How, how do you see it through three? Man, I mean, it's a pretty close fight. And uh, I think Juliana, though, she's doing a really, really good job at circling off to her right, especially when Denise comes and rushes in. You know, Denise has been getting really frustrated right now trying to find her range. But, I mean, that's why the champ is the champ. She has perfected her distance and her range and getting out of the way when somebody bum rushes her, just like how I bum rushed her in my fight. Uh, so, yeah, you know, I was kind of having flashbacks as I watched this. But, um, you know, credit to Denise. When they do have flurries, Denise, is delivering that power. I don't think uh, Velasquez has actually felt that kind of power yet in any of her fights. So she's definitely respected Denise's power, but very technical fight by both ladies. I'm glued to the screen. Can't wait to see these final rounds. Championship rounds coming up. There's a champion who's been there before, but you see the way the fight has changed here. You can see it on her face and Denise Gilholz's face through the last couple of rounds. So it all started. It's very simple, but it was the right jab that has taken Denise Gilholz off balance and done damage. Absolutely right. Right now, through three rounds, I have Juliana Velasquez up 29-28. Let's see if that changes in this round. Much of the first round had that look on her face like I, this isn't the puzzle I thought it would be, but she started putting that Rubik's Cube together in round two. Still think the champion is loading up on the front foot. Well, not right within a second, she's not but You can see when she decides to plant her feet. She puts a lot of weight. She starts leaning forward on that leg. Escape, circle to the right, circle to the right. She was just talking about. Well, the reason she's circling to the right is the power hand of Denise Keelholz is her right hand, so we'll go away from the power. <laughs> Even the 
away size, giving away reach. Uh, take damage, trying to get inside that these skill holds has over the last two plus rounds. At what point in a five-round championship fight do you have to change up what you're doing because it's just not working? I mean, there, there's enough time left, but that fifth round can go quick, especially if Juliana Velasquez gets her own round. You're so right. But it's a matter of right now we don't even know what her corner is telling her. They could be telling her she's winning. I don't believe she is, and I think she's just accepting more damage right now. And Juliana's just winning the exchanges more often. And she's got a better... Uh, right now, take a look at the defense. That's circling off to the left side of Denise is really working for her. Take a look at those kick stats and punches, though. Kicks landed, 6 to 20. Then go to the punches. 46, 231 compared to 27, 165. We all put a remind you. Numbers are the numbers, but sometimes it's as simple as looking at the damage on the face to see what those strikes have done. One of the first things you learn is who would you rather be at the end of the fight? That is exactly it. Right now, who do you believe is accepted for damage in this fight? There's that little leg kick that I was talking about from Denise, though. Again, doing a really nice job of circling out, resetting, making Denise come back into her range. As she controls. Here's some of the shots Denise landed. That right hand lands. Doesn't land with a lot of power, but it landed clean. And then Velasquez returns the favor. Goes that right with that left straight down the pipe again. And he's trying to return with the counter strike. Just a little bit off. I am confident in the way I see it. I'm confident in the way you see it. I'm not as confident that everyone else sees it the way we do, which is 3-1 for Velasquez, but some, there's certainly discussion about some of these rounds enough that if you're the champion right now, you can't think you have it put away. No, you need to absolutely go after winning this round. Two world champions going into round five. And again, the champion is walking into trouble here. Getting the better of the exchanges here early in round five. So 
Circle to the right. Circle to the right. Circle to the right. If something works, stick with it. And it's the right game plan. Stay away from that power hand. difference right now three planet to eight not a big difference in the output of those ten probably two or three of the most damaging shots she's thrown in the fight oh no doubt so you want to be an mma judge everyone thinks it's so easy It's just the off. Yeah, almost cost her. Yep. Yeah, that's that's right. Nice right hand. Stood and traded with one of the most dangerous strikers in the world, as she said she would for five rounds. Would this fight be as close if she had? We're not going to find out. It's also amazing when you look at it. Juliana's taking some big shots from Denise, but she's, it doesn't look like she's taking hardly anything. She hasn't marked up hardly at all. But the tenth of the top club, going to a knee. We've seen that sporadically, some different offense. To throw that hook like you just saw over the top. Every time she throws that right hand, that left hook should be covered. The opportunity is there, the drama is always there as long as it's Denise Gillis on the other side. Nice clean shot by Juliana. That's been a better fifth round for her as it's gone on. Minute 25 for the world title. And another good shot to counter left from Denise Gill. So that left hook over the top is there for Denise. She really needs to go to it. Here. They both went after it. They put on a fantastic performance. Denise Gilholz just pressured the entire time going after it. Juliana landing a beautiful jab that I have as the difference maker in the fight. I have it 48 47. But this fight could go to either, either lady. You never know what the 
the judge was going to say. Look at these shots right here. Inside, nice shot landed. Beautiful right hand again by Denise. And then there was Juliana being able to lap. That, that, that jab was everything in the fight. It really started to slow Denise down. And then she was able to land. Even shots, counter shots going backwards. Here comes Denise back with the shots. There was no give by either woman in this fight. That was the, in the fifth round. Big shot by Denise. Beautiful left hand straight down the pipe by Juliana. She's tried to jump knee. I saw it exactly as you did. And it depends if you're a numbers person or you're a damage person. That's what this comes down to. That is exactly what it comes down to. Brother Rafael, never far from the mind to the world champion, Juliana Velasquez. Did she do enough to retain her title? Let's find out the answer from Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone five full rounds in this world title fight, we'll go now to your three judges at cage side. Your first judge, Marcel Varela, scores the fight 48-47. He sees the fight for Velasquez. Your second judge at cage side, Brian Miner, scores the fight 48-47. He sees it for Keelholz. At cage side, your third and final judge, Jacob Montalvo, scores the fight 48 to 47 for the winner by split decision. And still, Bellator flyweight world champion, Juliana Velasquez. By the skin of her teeth and the strength of her jab, it's an and still for the champ. World Championship respect after this World Championship fight. Juliana Velasquez is undefeated. She is still the world champion, and she is with John McCarthy. Juliana Velasquez, that was a beautiful performance by both of you. You both gave no quarter in this. You were going after each other. She was pressuring you, and you were landing a beautiful jab that I thought was the difference maker in this fight. Foi uma bela luta entre vocês. Ela quis a pressão e você estava com aquele lindo jab que eu acho que foi a chave para você sair com a vitória da noite. Ah, primeiro lugar. Aqui eu ganhei o cinturão, aqui eu me consagrei campeão mundial. Eu estou muito feliz de poder fazer minha primeira defesa no mesmo local que eu ganhei. Muito obrigada. É, realmente, eu acho que eu estava me encontrando no jab, eu não estava me encontrando muito no meu direto. Mas tudo bem, luta é luta, o importante é que eu consegui achar um jeito de, de pará-la, o ímpeto dela. Yeah, first of all, I'm very thankful to be here because here was where I won my belt and now I got my first title defense. I believe I had a lot of success with my jab, but I have had a hard time with my straight ride. And so things didn't go exactly like I wanted, but I'm pretty happy with how I performed in the result. In most of your fights, you're the fighter pressing the action. You're the one going forward. And throughout this fight, most of the time, it was Denise putting the pressure on you. How did that feel during the fight? Na maioria das suas lutas, quem bota a pressão é você. Nessa luta, não. Ela estava pressionando e você saiu. Como é que foi isso? Como é que você sente sobre isso? Sim, na verdade, nessa luta, eu estava procurando que dar um pouco, né? E eu não estava achando o espaço para conseguir fazer o que eu realmente estava treinando. Mas, é, eu sempre boto a pressão. Não foi dessa vez, mas eu não só sei jogar, eu não sei só lutar botando pressão, como eu sei também receber a pressão e dominar a pressão o tempo inteiro. Isso acho que define um atleta. Yeah, I was actually thinking about working my takedowns and I was wasn't finding it the, the the timing to do it. Uh, and yeah, most of my fights I'm the one pressuring, but I showed here that I can fight on the outside as well and withstand the pressure and I think that's what also makes a champion. Well, since you're the champion, who do you believe 
deserves the shot at that belt next. Quem você acha que merece disputar o cinturão com você agora? Olha, eu eu tenho duas pessoas que eu, que eu acredito que possa ser. Eu, eu poderia ser tanto a Elimalei, né? E acho que eles Carmuche, né? Acho que ela falou que eu não estou pressionando tanto nas lutas. Eu acho que eu, eu gostaria de ter a oportunidade de lutar com ela. Yeah, there are two people that I think could get the title shot next. Next, the first one would be Elimalei, and the other would be Liz Carmuche. She said I was gonna make some pretty fights, so I'd like to show that to her. Well, I'll tell you what, congratulations on your first title defense. It was a fantastic performance. Ladies and gentlemen, the champion, Juliana Velasquez. Guys, it was a fight that lived up to the hype in a lot of ways, and we do two things. Those are two champions. We just watched battle for five rounds, and the other thing is the champ was not lying to us all week when she said she was going to stand for five rounds. Well, she wasn't. Uh, she did definitely do what she said she was going to do. You got to assume that her brother, Rafael, is uh, super proud of her tonight as he watches on. Uh, Alimale, I'm going to have to come to you right away. We asked her who she wanted to face next. She says uh, two names, Liz Carmouche. She also says your name. What do you think of that? I mean, of course I want to fight for the belt again. Uh, and so I, I think that maybe this could come for so full circle. Sorry, I'm stumbling. But, uh, you know, maybe we can do it in the middle of the Pacific Ocean somewhere. Somewhere at the end of the year, I don't know, small little island. Hey, Uncle Scott, <laughs> we go back there. Um, but thank you for that, Juliana. I mean, that was a great fight. I, I agreed with the judges, honestly. I thought that she used, utilized that jab. We still haven't been able to crack the code. Like I said, she does an amazing job circling to her right and getting out of the way uh, of the bug rushes and flurries. So I thought that she did enough to retain her belt. She is a true world champion defending her belt, and we'll see who's next. Well, I know we would like to uh, see that fight in Hawaii, I know is what you were saying. Josh, did you agree with the uh, outcome there, the decision? You guys, look, we're splitting hairs. It could have went either way. I had uh, Denise winning one, two, and five, but I can understand why she lost potentially the second round. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sit up here and throw my arms in the air, but I, I actually gave the fight to Denise, but it was close and I don't like the saying, like you said, like, if you want to be the champion, you got to beat the champion. And, but to me, they were both slinging it. They were both letting it go. And those are the type of fights you want to see. It sucks that someone has to come out on, on, on top and someone has to come out on bottom. But the bottom line is, they both performed really well tonight. I was very happy for the performance. You know, someone's always got to win and someone's got to lose. That's just the aim of the game. It's definitely not a fight that Denise has anything to be ashamed of whatsoever. She put on a show, both of these women did, so I'm super proud of them. And again, excited to see where that belt goes next. Absolutely. Well, it's a very entertaining fight. Uh, both women throwing it down tonight. Well, that does it for us up here at the desk. Ali Malay, it was always you know, great having you up here with us. You need to heal up so we can uh, maybe see you fight there real soon. And Josh, of course, great job tonight as well. You too. Oh, thank Didn't you. It's the first back. compliment I've got tonight from both of you guys. <laughs> thank you. Thank well, you he and much. I will be back at it in a little over two weeks. We'll be at the Forum in Inglewood. Uh, that's going to be an incredible matchup. Uh, you want to stick around for that. All right, well, for the fans at home, if you'd like to revisit any portion of tonight's fight action, Showtime's got you covered. Check your listings to find replays of Bellator MMA on Showtime and Showtime Extreme. Now, remember, at the end of the month, I just talked about it, it's the highly anticipated final of the Featherweight World Grand Prix. Bellator's pound-for-pound -pound best and double champion Patricio Pipple defends his title against the dangerous and undefeated A.J. McKee. Now, for one man, it will be the thrill of victory. The other, the agony of losing $1 million and, of course, the belt. That is Saturday, July 31st, 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific, live on Showtime. Well, fight fans, don't go anywhere because coming up next, a sneak peek at tomorrow night's Showtime Championship Boxing main event. It's all access Jermel Charlo versus Castaño. So stick around. Well, another great night of Bellator MMA action for our fight fans tonight. We had a blast up here. Sean, back over to you to break down our final thoughts. Plus, Jen, nothing beats a shout out to Uncle Scott for the former champ. Travis Davis made an impression at middleweight, but Johnny Eblen was dominant in a unanimous decision victory, showing a lot of tools in that toolbox, including the suplex, making everybody in Missouri proud. Our last time we saw Arlene Blenko, she was fighting for the championship against Chris Cyborg, the first step on her road back, a third round TKO of a very game, Diana Silva. 
Mateus Matos adding his name to the list at Bantamweight with a second round TKO of CJ Hamilton. The Pitbull Brothers product looked like it in this performance. It was a good one. Lightning struck twice the wrong way for Matt Mitrione. Another clash of heads and another loss for the veteran as Tyrell Fortune gets his 11th win and a phenomenal main event. And Juliana Velasquez retains the title. For Jen Brown, Josh Thompson, Alima Lay, McFarland, and John McCarthy, I'm Sean Grandy. Thanks for spending this night with us. AJ and Patricio, it's on July 31st on Showtime.